Good morning. Uh, I'm going to talk about uh, an interesting group of people from Australia, and this relates to the major topic of social change. When we have hunters and gatherers, we can study them in a microcosm, and sometimes you can isolate and see how one or a few small things cause massive change to occur in a society. You and I, of course, are living in such a complex society that the change is so overwhelmingly rapid that there'll be jobs five years from now that we've never even dreamt of, currently, of course. Uh, so, it, it, trying to get an idea of social change here and what causes it. This is called the Year You Rant, and spelled Y-I-R, Y-O-R-O-N-T. And they're from Australia, but they come from about that area of Australia. And the Year Year Rod had first encounters with European civilization back as early as the 1600s, then again in the 1800s, 1900s, and about 1930-something, uh, 34 I believe, uh, an anthropologist studied the Year Year Rod and studied them undergoing massive social change. And if you look at the Year Year Rod, we're going to look at a series of, of various things, but one thing that's going to come up time and time again, and that's the name of the article if you want to look it up, called Steel axes for Stone Age Australians. And fo follow, there we go, follow this steel axe quite closely because the steel axe has both real physical meaning and uses, but it has highly symbolic meaning within the context of their culture. And it is an agent of change, just as the internet being introduced as a technological wonder in our own society has been an agent of change for us. It has caused massive sweeping changes of all sorts, some good, some bad. You'll also see the effects of religious beliefs and how something like a steel axe can be impacted by religious beliefs. Now let me tell you a little bit about the year you're on before I go through the steps of what occurred here. And you'll be able to follow this, so you might want to get these notes down particularly. If you look at the year you rot, within this hunting and gathering society, there were very clearly defined roles for everybody. Male, female roles, roles for the young, middle-aged, old, and roles for uh, brothers and brothers, sisters and sisters. There were no two people that were considered exactly equal. That seems a little alien to you and me, but in any conversation of five or six people, in the year you rot society, everybody knew exactly who was subordinate and who was superordinate which was very curious. Uh, so that was kind of a marker. The second thing was that males, and again you might not like this at all, but males were considered superior to females. And that was part of their day-to-day -day interaction. Females were dependent upon males. Of course males were dependent upon females as well, but the status interchange went to the males. A third thing was that younger people paid respect to their elders, even if it was a younger brother, in any discussion under practical conditions, if there was a disagreement, the older brother would typically get the respect of winning if the arguments were about equal because of his age difference. A fourth thing was trading patterns. The year you rot, uh, had these great trading patterns where they had partners that they regularly dealt with. And again, it was based upon a subordinate, superordinate basis. These traders were either superior to you or inferior to you in social status. And they would travel along ways, for example, to get the stone, they travel as much as 400 miles to the south to get the stone that they needed to, to have stone axes. Now stone axes were something very powerful in their society, but they were primarily used by women and children to some extent, men to some extent, but men owned these stone axes. So a woman would go to borrow a stone axe, she had to cut the wood, she, had, she was in charge of cutting most of the wood, for example. She'd have to go to a particular male relative, usually her husband, if her husband wasn't around, it was a particular brother. Uh, the children would go to a particular male to borrow an axe. So this borrowing pattern reinforced the status pattern by age, gender, etc., day in and day out. When they went uh, on these uh, big trading trips to get the stone or to trade spears that they made, they'd like typically trade a dozen spears that they had made out of wood to uh, somebody who had uh, carved an axe head for them, and they had to go 400 miles, and obviously this is a major trip. And they'd go during the seasons when there were great religious festivals. So when they were in these great religious festivals, they'd have uh, great celebrations, people would be very happy, they'd be reinforcing their totemic, or totem, T-O-T-E-M, belief systems. 
the Aboriginal belief system that the ancestors were living in some time in the distance past and the present was just a mere symbolic representation of that past. And so this was reinforcing every time they went there and only the men would go, the women didn't get to go. So the men got to bond, increase their superiority, increase their religious connections, and they'd come back all reinvigorated and happy and excited about life and, and proceed to put together these stone axes with the handles and the sacred feathers and all this good stuff. Uh, 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 the, uh, the fifth point there was the religious festivals. The sixth point is that they divided life into several totems or categories, and these totems were related to clans. The stone axe came out of the sunlight cloud iguana clan. Now, I know that's a mouthful, so let me repeat it. The people traced their ancestry who owned the stone axes back to the original ancestors who had created these stone axes for them, and that clan was the Sunlight Cloud Iguana Clan. Now, any man could really make a stone axe that had access to the trading patterns. He didn't have to come from that Sunlight Clan, but in ceremonies, they traced all of this origin of who gave it to their tribe back to this clan, and it was considered good, it was considered positive, it was considered powerful. But anything that had to do with white man's intervention, for example, a couple of times Europeans had come in and just shot people on the spot. They had grabbed uh, your kids to go uh, work in their plantations in Australia and other places. And so there was kind of an animosity there. And so uh, they um, put anything that had to do with the white man, or that was new in general, into the corpse clan. Now this was also a totem idea. It was also a breakdown of a uh, kinship group. And it wasn't horrible to be from the corpse clan, but the stone axe was not connected to the corpse clan. But the new steel axe, which now, let me give you the rest of the story, a steel axe was introduced by missionaries who came in and indiscriminately gave it to people who promised to be good Christians. And by that meant it was, you know, what, by that they meant the 19th century and uh, 20th century early view that you had to dress like Western Europeans, you had to act like Western Europeans, you had to give up all your other religious beliefs. And they would give it to kids, they'd give it to women, they'd give it to young people, they'd give it to old people, anybody would attend their religious services and claim to be saved. Uh, so we kind of got the basis laid here. Now let's talk about what occurred. As these missionaries came in, they were good people, they meant to do well, they helped the Yer Yaron in lots of ways, and yet within one generation, the culture of the Yer Yaron had just virtually disappeared. They'd just been wiped off the face of the earth. Not biologically, they interbred with the missionaries, hence the missionary position statement. But culturally, their culture had just started to disintegrate. And let's go back and use the steel axe as one of the central facets that caused this culture to disintegrate. And there are many other things going on at the same time, so the, even this is not as complex as it actually was. All right, you, you go in and you give steel axes to anybody. Well, what does that do to number one, to the superior subordinate status? Well, anybody can have a steel axe, doesn't matter your age, doesn't matter your gender, and so it starts making people more equal and takes the power away from the males. And you might see that as positive, of course. Number two, male-female sex roles. Not, not just subordinate, su superordinate in general, but male-female sex roles change radically because now women could have these steel axes. And by the way, the steel axes don't break hardly ever like the stone axes. And that'll have some implications. Uh, it broke down age roles. You could give this to a, a little kid who had not earned the right, male or female, that, that uh, he, could, he or she could own a steel axe, given out indiscriminately. No reason to have to borrow it from a specific, specific kinship member. Uh, let's see. Uh, trading patterns. There was no reason to go 400 miles to the north now, or 400 miles in any direction, to go on these extensive trading patterns. And so these kinship relationships started breaking down. And keep in mind that they were also going to religious festivals, which did what? Reinforced their old-time religion, which was good enough for them. They were just happy with their old-time religion, but this starts breaking down because they're not reinforcing it by the trading patterns. Why walk 400 miles when you got a steel axe given to you by somebody right here? 
Then we come to the symbolic nature of the steel axe and the stone axe. The stone axe had represented what the sunlight cloud iguana clan had given them in the mythical creation past. It was good, it kept the order of the society, it got work done, it showed the relationship between men and women, children and old people, etc., etc. But the steel axe came from the West, it came from white people, and it was different. It didn't break hardly at all, it lasted nearly forever, and so they had trouble and they put it in the corpse clan. Well, it's an axe, shouldn't it be in the sunlight cloud iguana clan totem? Or is it a steel axe, it's an outsider's axe, therefore should it go into the corpse clan? So it started breaking down basic religious categories. And you can see one fairly simple thing, an introduction of a steel axe and lots of other cultural changes occurring at the same time, started breaking down step by step by step basic aspects of the culture that caused cultural cohesion to collapse. And then when you interviewed these people, this is an anthropologist who lived with them, when he interviewed them as this culture was collapsing, the typical response he got was, you know, life just is boring. It's not as much fun as it used to be. We used to have order. We used to know who was where and what they were doing. We used to get to go to these trading uh, festivals. We used to have more power in our religion. And now everything's confusing. It's just boring. And just as a side note, you know what the people did with all the extra time that was, was done by, by having steel axes? Did they go out and create great cathedrals? No. Did they go out and create new things that helped change their society for the better? No. You know what they did? They slept. <laughs> they, they were really good at taking extra naps. And that's all they did. So you see in one short generation an introduction of a technological artifact, bang, 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 caused the collapse of a simple society. What will the internet and so forth do to us, good and bad? Thank you.